Anatomy is the science that studies the structure of the body. Knowing how to properly represent the multiple elements involved in the makeup of the human vessel is essential for a manga artist. If the essence of the subject is not captured properly, the creation will appear uncanny or lifeless, rendering the drawing incapable of conveying the nature of its model. This goes beyond good or bad technique, as the pursuit is more surgical than artistic. This encapsulates a wide range of aspects, such as the way the characters move, how their bodies adapt to the motions, and if their movements are realistic or not when it comes to normal human locomotion. The lengthening and contracting of their muscles as they evolve from panel to panel is also key to maintain continuity and allow the reader to visualize an animated sequence rather than a simple succession of drawings. As you might have understood by now, I will be mostly focusing on manga and not anime, which means the entirety of the discussion will be centered around ink. In terms of human anatomy, the prime movers of the body are muscles. You might be surprised to hear that this isn't going to be the focus of this video, however, as there is an extra layer of tissue besides the myofibrils that play an integral role in the makeup of the body and its representation in works of fiction, namely the skeleton, organs, and blood vessels. I am painfully aware that a video centered around grapplebaki which doesn't revolve around muscles is a blasphemy, but worry not, I have something in the works on that very topic for you guys. For today, we'll leave the brawn aside and focus more on the brains, and hearts, of this martial arts series. Despite its Homeric battles and impossibly buff characters, Grapplebaki is a series steeped in realism. The setting takes place in our world, with human antagonists evolving in an environment that obeys the same rules and limitations as we are subjected to every day. Despite certain aspects that should make it look completely unrelatable, there was evident work put in by the author to allow us to feel connected to his heart without needing the suspension of disbelief to be so severe that it would kill any kinship we might have with the Grapplebaki back universe. The accuracy with which the human body is depicted is an evident aspect of this realism. Characters follow standard human proportions, and even if their frames and muscles are often distorted or blown up to the point of barely looking human, there is never the slightest mistake in structural disposition. In short, we share a common anatomy, but they are governed by a completely different physiology. Besides the faithful reproduction of muscle fibers and bone attachments displayed by Itagaki, we can also mention his borderline chirurgical inclinations that lead every single organ, circulatory systems and bones to be replicated faithfully. The hyperrealism of his stroke is important to allow the reader to feel invested in the story. Even though we know that the characters are essentially superhumans, we need to believe that they are bound by the same condition that defines us all mortals. If Yujiro was decapitated, he would die, regardless of his strength. If Baki lost too much blood, he would faint, even if he is the hero of the story. This sounds evident, but a lot of shonen failed to maintain that realism creating a de facto plot armor that shields its characters and suppresses any sense of anxiety we might feel at the thought of their potential demise. When a protagonist in Baki loses a fight or gets hurt, they get injured. Granted, those injuries are never as serious as they should be, and they tend to heal fast, but they still occur. There is always a clear description of the damage sustained and the way in which it will impact the fighter in the near future. Objectively, there is no need for the author to go to such length. Those little lectures serve no real exposition purposes, and they don't promote the use of the EX Machina either. Actually, they make them unusable altogether. It is like the author is finding any chance he can to cut off potential retreats the story might take to further the plot. It is essentially a way to aggressively recenter the action in a pragmatic frame of mind via the constant reminder that the monsters you see destroying walls and jumping 15 feet in the air are in fact humans. That fanatical fervor to adhere to anatomical charts, besides its use to the narration, also serves to give Grapplebaki its edge. The manga is relatively gory, but not in the way most modern fiction production choose to engage in. Since the setting and characters are born from a realism bent to the point of being unbelievable, its application of gore follows suit. The fighters of the series, who are impossibly resistant men, are able to endure impossibly offensive wounds. The use of morphological accuracy, instead of sanitizing the body horror, gives it an almost clinical aspect, as if we were invited to observe and reflect on every disturbing little detail that inhabit our own bodies. 
On top of that, the precision with which the graphic injuries are being depicted as they happen make them feel permanent, as if the human body had returned to an inevitable state of decrepitude from which it would never recover. Of course, this feeling of dread is proven wrong times and times again, as our favorite characters keep coming back from the gruesome gashes they collected during their last battle. That is, when there are many players. One cannot help but think about all the background fodder that suffered the same treatment, but who are never given a shot at recovery. The actors of Grabrabaki are fully aware of this state of affairs, and don't hesitate to use this scientific knowledge to their advantage. Martial arts, besides the heart and physicality they require, are often reduced to their simplest expression, which is the destruction of the human body through biological means. Even Jack, who appears more barbaric than the rest, is always making sure to bite certain tendons or arteries to cause as much damage as possible. Everything, it seems, is for the sake of combat. I can't help but appreciate the irony of a fighting series having the bulk of its fighters rock a PhD in anatomy. This solid grasp over the mechanisms of the vessel is also precious when it comes to avoiding damage. After all, if you know how to destroy something, you are also armed with the necessary information to prevent its destruction. And since the character all shares a similar anatomy, it becomes a game of who will be able to have the perfect mix of both savant understanding and savage skills to perfectly execute the ultimate game plan of any martial arts series, with the goal of victory over the opponent. As stated just now and in the introduction, this precise representation of human anatomy also serves the purpose of making the actions of the characters believable. Not just with the way their bodies look as they move, but also with how they go through the motions in relation to the way they are designed. Drawing from static anatomical sketches, the realistic dynamism of Grapprobaki is the main reason why the fights look so lively, and what made the series a household name in the world of combat anime in the first place. Now that we've seen how the motor is made, it's time to see it in action, and that's exactly what we'll be discussing in the next installment of this series that will be focused on movement.